Good afternoon and welcome to our Women and Infant Structure Series. I am Dr. Galat Hakim, Assistant Vice President of International Healthcare Partnerships and Insurance Development at Baptist Health International. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this informative presentation this afternoon. I would like to extend warm greetings to our friends across Latin America, the Caribbean, and everyone joining us today. During this interactive presentation, you'll have the ability to ask questions via the Q&A feature located on the bottom of your screen. I will be your moderator for today's lecture. This afternoon, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. F uh, Philip Tattlebaum. Uh, his presentation is titled Fe Fetal MRI and Complex Prenatal Diagnosis. Dr. Uh, Tattlebaum has uh, served as a pediatric and general radiologist at Baptist uh, Health South Florida for the past 11 years. Uh, he is experienced in uh, multimodality pediatric imaging using uh, radiography, ultrasonography, fluoroscopy, and imaging of the urinary and, gen and gastrointestinal tract and uses these modalities in his daily practice. He completed his medical training at Downstate Medical School in Brooklyn, New York, where he also served as uh, uh, his clinical internship in pediatrics. Um, he um, went to um, Main Moint uh, Medical Center in New York uh, for his diagnostic radiology residency and completed his fellowship in pediatric radiology at Boston Children's Hospital at Harvard Medical School. During his fellowship, Dr. Tattlebaum uh, trained at the Maternal Fetal Care Center, where he studied under many of the innovators in the subspecialties of fetal MRI and worked with many renowned pediatric and fetal surgeons. Dr. Tattlebaum has taught extensively throughout his career, lecturing on a range of topics, including uh, congenital orthopedic anomalies, neonatal bowel obstructions, imaging guiding um, guidelines in clinical pediatrics, issues related to contrast media, emergency pediatric imaging, and radiation dose considerations in the adult and pediatric population. He serves on multiple hospital quality improvement and peer review committees in the radiology and pediatrics department at Baptist Health South Florida. He also serves on the fluoroscopy uh, steering committee for the Society of Pediatric Radiology. Please let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Philip Tattlebaum. Dr. Tattlebaum, what a pleasure having you this afternoon. You may go ahead and share your screen. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction. Are you able to see my screen? We do. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that introduction. Um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, fetal MRI and complex prenatal diagnoses. Um, and again, my name is Phil Teitelbaum. I've been at Baptist for about 11 years now. But before I uh, start talking, I would like to introduce the rest of my team. Um, this is the Division of Fetal Imaging at Baptist Health South Florida. Um, this is our leader, Dr. Ann Podrasky. I'm, I'm sure many of you know her name. She's a preeminent radiologist. Uh, she's a director of uh, ultrasound at Baptist. She's been here for over 25 years. And using her experience in prenatal imaging, uh, using ultrasound, she brought fetal, image, fetal MRI really into the Baptist system. Uh, my other colleague, Dr. Fields, uh, was our former director of pediatric uh, radiology. Um, he's originally trained in the UK. He's a fellow of the uh, Royal College of Radiologists, which is one of the highest distinctions, um, the most distinctive uh, radiology societies in the world. Um, he came to the United States, did um, several fellowships at Yale University. He's been here at Baptist for 18 years, and uh, you've already been introduced to me. Um, you know, I love to talk about the doctors on our team, but um, creating a fetal MRI program really is an integrated effort. Um, it really starts with our referring clinicians, our obstetricians, uh, the maternal fetal medicine uh, specialists, and our pediatric surgeons. And you know, the backbone really is communication, knowing what we need to do to help our patients. Um, I, I can't say enough about our technologists. This is one of our uh, MRI uh, technologists, Ahmed. Um, our, the technologists who are involved in fetal MRI uh, at Baptist have specifically requested uh, privileges in fetal imaging. They want to do this. This is a kind of a, I would say, a high emotion uh, modality. We are, you know, they, these are the, the patient-facing uh, technologists who are dealing with 
patients who are really kind of at the lowest um, lowest time of their life. They, this is a, you know, women are coming in for, they have basically just heard that there's something potentially wrong with, uh, with their child and we're working them up. These are, this is a very high emotion um, exam and I have to give a lot of credit to our technologists um, who, who have um, asked to be part of this effort. Um, but most importantly, I'd really like to thank the institution that we're partnered with, Baptist Health South Florida, um, for multiple reasons. Aside from the resources that they've provided us, they've really given geographic access to our patients. We have six centers that are uh, available from north to south, east to west in South Florida, in Broward and Miami-Dade counties. Um, they've provided an environment not only a, just a, a a physically comfortable environment, but also an emotionally supportive environment for our patients. And they've provided um, huge uh, support in terms of staffing and time. Um, these uh, fetal MRIs take quite a bit of time. Uh, so they've been really generous and very giving in terms of uh, the scheduling and the, the, the time pressure that we have um, to, to obtain these exams. So today, um, in terms of the scientific knowledge aspect of what I, I'm talking about, um, I'd like to briefly discuss uh, MRI technique and fetal MRI technique, specifically with regard to safety. Um, I'd like to talk about the limitations and the advantages vis-a-vis um, -vis ultrasound. I'd like to very briefly just discuss some history of MRI and fetal MRI. Um, and then I'd like to spend the bulk of the talk just showing cases um, that we see on a routine basis here uh, at Baptist South Florida. So basics of MRI. Um, so the general, you know, at rest, a normal, in a normal environment, the hydrogen atoms in our body are rotating and moving around with a random, dis random distribution. When we take a patient and their hydrogen ions and we put them into a very strong magnet, the hydrogen atoms align parallel and anti-parallel to the magnetic, uh, to magnetic field. Uh, the unit of man magnetic strength that we use is Tesla. So you may have heard that, you know, 1.5 Tesla magnet, that's the kind of the routine strength of a magnet, of, of a magnet, uh, of a magnet that we use in MRI. Um, we also sometimes use three Tesla magnets. It's a stronger magnet. And in research, uh, there are some institutions that use seven Tesla magnets. Now, when the um, atom is aligned within the magnetic field, we exert an external radio frequency pulse, uh, knocking the atom out of alignment with the, with, the with the magnetic field. When we shut off that RF pulse, the atom falls back into a lower energy state, it emits energy, and we're able to receive that energy. And using that, we can create uh, an image, a three-dimensional image of the body, how much, and basically uh, the brightness on the image is a surrogate of how, how many hydrogen ions are at a specific site. And basically we'll, we'll repeat this, um, this process over and over again to create a picture of the entire body. This process requires no ionizing radiation. So we're using radio frequencies, not X-ray frequencies. And the RF pulses de deposit very low levels of energy and tissue. So I'm most certainly not an MRI physicist, um, but I'm just describing this process to you specifically with regard to safety. Now, in MRI safety, um, well, there are three things that we think about. First is the effects of the magnetic field, the effects of the radio frequency pulse that we're exerting on the patient, and the acoustic effects, because um, the radio frequency coil that creates uh, the pulses is extremely noisy. If you've ever been in an MRI room, in an MRI suite, it's extremely noisy. And of course, we're concerned, you know, that we can give the mother, um, you know, earplugs and ear coverings to prevent any acoustic damage, uh, but we can't do that for the fetus. Okay, so in terms of the effects of the magnetic field, we can, we can screen patients for any metal implants. So things like um, you know, pacemakers, neural stimulator devices, uh, aneurysm clips. So that's, you know, that's something that generally we're able to take care of uh, fairly straightforward. So the question really is about the radio frequency pulse that I mentioned that does deposit small amounts of energy. There were some early research articles uh, in, the early, uh, time, in the early days of MRI that raised 
the possibility of possible teratogenicity in um, developing fetuses. Most of these articles really didn't carry out into um, any uh, real life uh, practice. And we've been using, again, MRI has, has been popular for well over 30 years now, or about 30 years now, I should say. And we have multiple studies showing that the electromagnetic fields and the RF pulses are safe in humans, both in adults, but also in developing fetuses, including this uh, longitudinal study that was published um, in AJR back in, in 2019. Um, the final uh, area of concern was the acoustic effects, that loud noise. And there are a lot of studies that are out there that show absolutely no difference in hearing outcomes uh, between uh, children who, have un who underwent a fetal MRI in utero and those who didn't. So we believe the acoustic effects are safe, most likely because of attenuation of the, um, of the sound by maternal soft tissues. This past year, um, the American College of Radiology and the Society for Pediatric Radiology issued a, a revised um, uh, white paper, um, essentially say based on all the data that I, I, I just showed in the last couple of slides, um, present data have not conclusively documented any deleterious effects of MRI at 1.5 Tesla and 3 Tesla on the developing fetus. Therefore, no special consideration is recommended for any trimester in pregnancy. So I think it's really important when we are having a discussion with a pregnant patient about MRI, I think it's really important for us to be really unequivocal about the safety of MRI. We have experience um, and there are no associated um, deleterious effects on, on the fetus. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to talk about this very quickly. This is just kind of a, a little note of history. This is the first MRI image that was obtained uh, through the human body in 1977. This image took five hours to acquire on a 0 0.05 Tesla magnet. Um, what happened, th this, uh, this physicist, Dr. Raymond Damadian, uh, he actually, within a year, had a, a commercial contract um, that rushed a massive amount of research uh, into magnetic strength, the coils, the pulse sequences, and MRI basically came into clinical practice within a couple of years. Um, the original, uh, the, the first description of fetal imaging on MRI was in, uh, in The Lancet in 1983, and then in 1984, um, the American uh, Journal of OBGYN um, they, they, they proposed some early images and you know, they raised the possibility of routine use. Um, the real issue was motion. So like I mentioned in that, that last image, this took five hours to, to acquire. Um, and it was certainly better in, by the early 80s, um, but it was not good enough to really chase a moving fetus, okay? And remember where, when we are uh, creating the MR image, we are, um, receiving radio frequency signal, signals from a specific site in space. So if the structure that we're imaging is moving, we don't get any signal from it. We can't create the image. Um, we knew that motion was the, the, the real impediment to, to a good fetal imaging. There were some um, attempts in the early 90s to re reduce fetal motion by injecting muscle relactants into the umbilical veins, uh, which kind of boggles the mind, but um, it was done. Um, in 1994, uh, fetal MRI and really um, all of MRI practice was really revolutionized with single shot fast acquisition sequences. So I'm going to talk about haste and fiesta sequences. Um, images that used to take 15, 30, 45 seconds to acquire, we were suddenly able to get them in one second. And suddenly, you know, chasing a moving fetus became feasible. So let me just show you some images. Um, this is, these, these are um, two patients with uh, Galen and vein of Galen aneurysms. That's the, the formal term, former term, vein of Galen aneurysms. Um, this is an image obtained in 1991 in a fetus uh, back then, and then in 1998. These were the newer sequences, and you can really see the difference uh, in the anatomic detail that we're able to get. You can certainly make a diagnosis on the original uh, images. We see this, uh, this uh, bright structure, but reflecting the aneurysm, but if you look at the surrounding uh, uh, cerebrum, you really can't make out any, any detail. Um, this over here, this is a, a gradient echo T1 sequence uh, from 1998. You can make out the aneurysm, you can make out the connection with the straight sinus, you have a nice 
perfectly aligned axial image. And you can see the cell and gyri in the brain. Um, this is a corresponding haste image. This is, the, this is what we use now, um, the, these sequences. And again, you can see the cell and gyri of this perfectly aligned uh, image and the, um, the aneurysm shows up as a signal void. And you just kind of get a sense of the, the differences in detail that we were able to get um, by reducing, I shouldn't say eliminating, but reducing the, um, the motion artifact. The first uh, publications uh, really about practical fetal MRI came out in 1998. Um, the primary uses were um, intracranial and neurologic. Um, over the following decade, we really started exploring other applications for fetal MRI. So we started kind of in the brain, and then we worked our way into the gastrointestinal tract, the genital urinary tract. And then the question, of course, came about when, when does MRI really help us? When, when is it an effective modality with clinical implications? Um, I think anybody who's been in practice for more than you know, 10 or so years is probably familiar with the MOMS trial. This was a, a revolutionary uh, publication in 2011. Uh, the MOMS trial was, MOMS is M-O-M-S, Management of Myelomeningocele Study. This was a multi-center study in the United States um, that was one of the first explorations of the effectiveness of in utero surgery. So uh, what they were basically doing was they, they had um, two, two research wings. They had the, um, the fetuses who underwent fetal surgery for repair of myelomeningocele. Um, they, just to kind of show you, they, they would do an actual hysterotomy, they would find the dysraphic defect the spina, the, the, in these babies with spina bifida, and they would repair them, close up uh, the uterus, and allow the mom to carry the baby to gestation. And the, the, um, the benefits were so radical that they actually had to end this trial early because it was unethical to... Uh, assign any patients to the control arm. So the, the fetuses that underwent uh, fetal surgery, um, they, they, had, uh, they needed VP shunting less. They had less. If they did need a VP shunt, they needed less re revised uh, VP shunting. They had more lower extremity mobility, better bl uh, bladder and bowel function. Um, it was really a revolutionary trial. And I, I, I kind of bring this up in reference to fetal MRI because a lot of the inclusion criteria for this trial were based on findings on fetal MRI. And I think this was really a turning point for fetal surgery. It was really a turning point for fetal MRI. Not to say that we didn't use it before, but I think fetal MRI really took um, a big turn at around this time. So I mentioned some of the, you know, I mentioned the most of the applications earlier were neurologic. These, um, this list of diagnoses are just, these are diagnoses that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. These are not, um, you know, rare, rare entities, rare, rare diagnoses that we work up. Um, so you can see this is really um, every, every, uh, every system in the body, we, we work them up on, on uh, field MRI. Okay, so I'm going to start kind of with the, the image portion of, of, my, uh, of my talk. I want to just um, give a couple of definitions. When I use the term signal intensity, um, I'm, I'm uh, referring to the brightness on a single image, uh, brightness at a single point on the image. The opposite is a signal void, which is darkness. Um, and when I use the, terms pulse, the term pulse sequence, I'm referring to the radio frequency pulse or the combination of radio frequency pulses, or I'm using this, the, the stack or set of images uh, that are produced by uh, those RF pulses. I'm sure you've heard the terms T2 and T1, but there are hundreds of different pulse sequences that we use. Um, this is a T2 weighted image, a fluid weighted image, and this is the backbone of what, what we use in fetal imaging because it's very fast to acquire. Here are these beautiful, perfect images that I've chosen out, a nice axial through the brain. You can see the fluid in the frontal horns. You can see the CSF. You can even see the, the, um, the, the amniotic fluid between the fetal digits. Uh, this is a coronal view where you can actually see the CSF in the spine. You can see T2 signal intensity in the lungs because as the lungs, as the alveolar spaces develop, um, they, they, they carry more amniotic fluid, so they become brighter. And you can see some uh, urine in the collecting systems. You can see the fetal globe, you can see the stomach bubble, all these contain fluid. 
Uh, the next sequence that we use is T1 sequence, and the, the particular flavor of, of uh, T1 that we use is vibe. Um, and on T1 weighted images, uh, we highlight blood products, meconium, and fetuses that are greater than 20 weeks. And uh, we can see the liver as a, an intermediate signal intensity structure. So if you look at this image, just to orient you, these are the legs. We don't get very good uh, you know, anatomic um, detail here, but we do get um, uh, you know, chemical information about you know, the, the structures that we're looking at. So these are the legs. This is an axial view through the, through the body. And you can see this string-like thing that's bright. That's uh, meconium in the distal small bowel. This is another fetus. This is a coronal view where we can actually make out meconium throughout the colon, going all, down, all the way down the rectus sigmoid to the pelvic floor. And there's no dilation. So we can fairly confidently say that there's no anorectal malformation. Um, this is a T2 weighted image. This is a, uh, like the, the last sequences that I showed you. These are the fetal globes, but we see this dark area around the cerebellum, which corresponds to an area of brightness on T1 weighted images. And this is consistent with cerebellar hemorrhage. The last set of sequences uh, that we, we generally use are T2 flash sequences, which show us, uh, these are susceptibility images. So they show us calcium related um, signal voids. So on this image, you can make out the ribs, you can make out the ossific nuclei of the vertebral bodies. On this image, we caught a, a good view of a clavicle. Um, you can see the fetal calvarium and the vertebral bodies and the ribs. And on that last uh, case that I showed you with the, uh, the cerebellar hemorrhage, again, that dark area on T2, that bright on T1, we can see dark, a dark area corresponding to hemosiderin staining. The main limitation of fetal MRI, again, is still motion. That's not something that's been completely eliminated, even with our fast acquisition sequences. So while I'm going to show you these beautiful images and the textbooks and the journal articles will show you these beautiful images, in reality, probably 50% of our images come out looking more like this, completely non-diagnostic, which is why these exams can take so long. Uh, we tend to have a protocol that we use of specific imaging sequences, but they often need to be repeated. Uh, the other limitation is just fetal size. Um, each of these images has a, a finite thickness. We can really only go down to about three millimeters. So you can imagine earlier in, in uh, gestation, it's a little tougher to, um, to uh, see some of the, the smaller structures. Neural development also, the earlier we image, the less neural development there is, and it's the harder it is to talk about uh, the migrational pattern of the brain. And then the other limitation, obviously, is maternal anxiety. Um, and I've mentioned this a couple of times, but um, not only does the fetus move, but mom moves. Um, and and um, it's sometimes hard to hold your breath over and over and over again um, for the length of the exam. We try to keep women as comfortable as possible. Sometimes we need to reposition them. We certainly need to give them breaks in the middle of the exam. Again, one of the reasons why this can take so long. This is um, my usual uh, protocol, uh, my sequence protocol. Um, what we do is before we run any fetal MRI, we always, um, we always um, discuss with the technologist what we're looking for and which of these sequences is the most important to start with first. We always assume that we only have a few minutes of imaging. Um, we hope for longer, but um, we, always, we always kind of triage the images that we need. So I'm going to start by showing a couple of cases. For me, the benefits of fetal MRI are con confirming or negating an, ult an ultrasound finding, further characterizing an ultrasound finding. Very often, we'll find additional abnormalities. We can sometimes provide prognostication. And fetal surgeons uh, love fetal MRI because it provides a broader field of view for planning surgeries. So here are a couple of cases uh, where we're able to confirm or negate ultrasound findings. This is a 36-year-old woman, primogravida, presenting at 23 weeks for non-visualization of the cavum septum pellucidum. This mom was an absolute trooper. She was here, this was three weeks ago on Friday. Um, this mom was an absolute trooper. This fetus was moving around. Um, we actually imaged mom for an hour and 10 minutes. Um, and these are the exact five images that we were able to come up with that were diagnostic, but they showed that we were able to see the leaflets of the septum pellucidum. This is a normal study, and we were very proud and very happy to be able to give mom this, um, this good prognosis. 
Um, coincidentally, the same day, another woman came in, same same uh, concern on prenatal ultrasound, non-visualization of the cavum septum pellucidum. Um, unfortunately, this patient really wasn't able to stay in the magnet for very long. She was able to tolerate about 10 minutes of imaging. And um, the images that we got confirm the absence of a septum pellucidum on these coronal images. Uh, I'd like to just point out at 20 weeks gestation, we see much more sulci and gyri. We see the sylvian fissures infolded nicely. We see the insula over here. Um, but we see no cavum, we, we see no leaflets of the septum pellucidum either on the coronal images or the axial images. But on the sagittal image, we are able to see the corpus callosum from the genu all the way back to the splenium. Okay, um, absence of the septum pellucidum makes us think about a holoprosencephaly spectrum anomaly. There is clearly no lobar holoprosencephaly here. Um, Absence of pellucidum can be associated with agenesis of the corpus callosum. It can be associated with schizencephaly, um, but it can be isolated or it can be associated with septo-optic dysplasia. And we believe that in this particular case, it was the better prognosis of either an isolated absent septum pellucidum or uh, septo-optic dysplasia. Um, this was a, a woman who came in to exclude uh, Walker-Warburg syndrome in her fetus. Um, these were completely normal images, and we were happy to give her a good prognosis. These are uh, some images that I had to uh, get from a neuroradiology journal because I don't have any cases of Walker-Warburg syndrome, but um, it's really diagnosed by this uh, kind of um, uh, midbrain hindbrain kind of kinking over here, and also diagnosed by this kind of lysencephalic uh, appearance of the cortex with this sort of cortical cobblestoning. Um, and you can see in our fetus, we didn't have those, that, that, any of those stigmata. This was an early imaging, so we certainly wouldn't be able to say too much about the migration pattern, but we were able to give a, a, a we were able to say that there, uh, the stigmata of Walker Warburg were not present. Okay, some cases we will characterize, help characterize an ultrasound finding. So this was a 35 year old woman coming at 34 weeks with report of an abdominal cyst in her fetus. And these are just the, the images that we obtain initially through mom. It's a coronal, an axial, and a sagittal view. And I'd just like to point out the external genitalia of this, of this fetus. This is one leg, this is another leg, and we see the labia over here. So we're dealing with a phenotypically female uh, fetus presenting with an abdominal cyst. So we already kind of have in our head what this might be. I flip these images into an anatomic position. So you can see here the T2 bright lungs. This is the urinary bladder and the stomach bubble. And this is in the left lower quadrant, this is our the cyst that we were concerned about. On the T1 images, the cyst is not quite as bright as meconium, but it's also not quite as dark as the amniotic fluid. So that tells us that there's something, it's a sort of complex cyst. When we look at the axial images, we can actually see layering debris within the cyst on two separate sequences. And this gives us a very confident diagnosis of an ovarian cyst. There can be hemorrhage within these cysts, which is what accounts for those uh, imaging appearance, uh, for those imaging appearances. Um, these are almost invariably an isolated finding. They can sometimes persist postnatally. If there are complex ultrasound features postnatally, uh, they may be resected depending on uh, the surgical plan. Uh, this is a companion case in uh, a woman presenting at 27 weeks, also with an abdominal cyst. And over here, this is, again, a coronal view flipped into anatomic position. We see a T2 bright cyst extending from the liver margin along the peritoneal planes, kind of below the sacral promontory into the pelvis. And that also kind of gives us a kind of a maybe an idea of what we're looking at. We see this kind of dark debris within the within the cyst, and we see that that debris is T1 bright. We don't really see any meconium in the fetal abdomen. When we look at the susceptibility weighted images, we see a little bit of susceptibility artifact. We see those um, signal voids um, that tell us there's, there's some sort of mineralization. And we were already able to come up with a confident prospective diagnosis 
there was a subsequent ultrasound, this is prenatal, which showed that the cyst that had been previously seen now developed these echogenic areas with posterior shadowing compatible with calcification and made a very confident prospective diagnosis of a meconium pseudocyst. So meconium pseudocyst is a walled off loculation of meconium that's sitting in the peritoneal cavity due to an in utero bowel rupture. Um, these uh, meconium inside the peritoneal cavity will uh, cal calcify very rapidly. And this is a postnatal image on a different patient where you could see sheets of calcification along the margins of the peritoneal anatomy. This is an ultrasound image of the same baby. This is a sagittal view through the spleen. We see heterogeneous material anterior to the spleen reflecting meconium. And we see sheets of calcification along the margins of the mesenteric structures. Um, I'm going to skip over this case because I kind of showed it to you before. Uh, this was the cerebellar hemorrhage that I showed. We actually imaged because we weren't able to see on prenatal ultrasound why the cisterna magna looked so small. And we were able to uh, use uh, fetal imaging to um, uh, MRI to, uh, to characterize the lesion. This is a case of a sacral mass. Um, when we hear sacral mass, we certainly think about a sacrococcygeal teratoma, and that would generally be our first thought, except this lesion was a large cyst. So you can certainly have a, a cystic sacrococcygeal teratoma, um, but we wanted to further evaluate, see if we could characterize this further. So I was going through the slides uh, this afternoon, and I noticed something great on this slide. So we have the fetus and sagittal. This is the, the cystic lesion emanating from the pelvis. And the reason I actually put it on the slideshow is to show that it's separate from the spinal canal, because the differential diagnosis here would be um, would be an anterior meningus an anterior meningocele, right? So this tells you that it's probably not probably not an anterior meningocele. The reason I love this image and I noticed it this afternoon is if you look at the umbilical cord, um, you see it going through the anterior abdominal wall up the liver, and I can almost imagine it going through a ductus venosus up here into the right atrium. So this is the entire anatomy of the umbilical vein. And for the pediatricians in the audience, uh, you should know this anatomic relationship very well. This is not something that uh, we imaged on purpose. We just happened to catch this. Um, in this particular fetus, we also found an incidental finding of bilateral choroid plexus cysts, which are typically a, a, an isolated incidental finding, but when seen in conjunction with another anomaly are sometimes associated with aneuploidy. Um, the, uh, this particular mom elected not to continue the gestation. I don't have a final diagnosis, but our, diagno our differential diagnosis would be a cystic sacrococcygeal teratoma or potentially a lymphatic malformation. Um, if I have time, uh, do I have a couple, another couple of minutes? Okay. Um, I have a couple of uh, examples of abdominal wall defects and how we can help characterize them. This is a 43-year-old woman who came in with a uh, reported abdominal wall defect in her fetus. On this sagittal view, we can see loops of bowel externalized. On this image, this axial, we were able to see the insertion of the umbilical cord, and we can see that the externalized bowel is adjacent to it. And looking around, though, we don't see um, we don't see a membrane surrounding it. Um, I like these; these are T1 weighted images. Again, T1 weighted images show us meconium. And what's interesting about this is that all of the meconium containing structures are clustered in one side of the abdomen. And that tells us that the entire colon is on one side. This is a malrotation, right, which is expected with gastroschisis. But I think this is a, a great example of how um, different pulse sequences can help us evaluate anatomy. And this is a classic case of gastroschisis. Um, this is another case of an abdominal wall defect. We're imaging very early here at 17 weeks. And in this particular case, we see all of the abdominal contents externalized. We can see the liver external. We see bowel loops on the T1 weighted images. Again, we can show that the liver, which is bright on T1 images, it's external to the fetal uh, abdomen. And we see uh, meconium uh, containing bowel loops externalized as well. And this is a classic case of an omphalocele. So I'm kind of uh, 
moving up in degrees of uh, severity of abdominal wall defects. Uh, this is a, a final case. Um, this patient was referred to us for an abdominal wall defect in twin A. So we see a twin gestation. This is dichorionic diamniotic with separating membrane. This is fetus B. Fetus A is down here. We can already see an abdominal wall defect with the liver externalized. Some of the cone down images on the fetus again show this externalized uh, liver and some bowel. And this is the umbilical cord kind of uh, inserting kind of away from the abdominal wall. Again, that, that tells us that, that there, there's an omphalocele. Um, Looking more posteriorly, we see, we run our eyes down the spinal canal and we can see a posterior mening a myelomeningocele over here. We see this out outward bubbling of the spinal canal. Sometimes what we see is um, not always as important as what we don't see. So this is a coronal view, a coronal oblique view through the fetal pelvis. This is one leg, this is the other leg. And we notice that there's no bladder here. So the bladder is either externalized or not formed. And then on the T1 weighted images, this is fetus B. This is the normal fetus. We can see meconium in the rectus sigmoid going down to the pelvic floor. But when we run our eyes through fetus A, we see all of the externalized meconium containing structures and none of it extends to the pelvic floor, which is concerning for uh, an anal rectal malformation or an imperforate anus. So we've identified separate anomalies and uh, some of you may have heard of this. This is the OEIS complex of omphalocele, bladder extrophy, imperforate anus, and spinal anomalies. These can have associated renal anomalies. So um, these, these uh, children will have significant morbid morbidity throughout their life, but mortality is, is actually surprisingly um, low. Um, two more minutes. Are you okay with that? Yeah. So, so I have plenty of time, doctor. Oh, okay, okay. Um, sometimes on fetal MRI, we're going to actually find additional anatomic abnormalities that were not necessarily seen by ultrasound. Um, this was a patient sent in at 31 weeks gestation for severe ventricular megaly. And again, these are our, uh, kind of our, so to speak, scout views through, um, through mom. And I don't know if, uh, if Dr. Martin is on the line. She's this is her, uh, patient. Um, we confirm the presence of severe ventriculomegaly on these axial images. Um, I would call your attention to the fact that we're at 31 weeks of gestation now, and the cortical pattern is very abnormal. Now, there's really no sulci in gyri. We see minimal infolding of the sylvian fissures, but at 31 weeks, we really should see a lot more of the insular cortex. There were some additional... Uh, uh, concerning findings, um, we see over here a posterior uh, fossa, uh, posterior fossa cyst that extends above the cerebellum. Uh, we were a little bit concerned about the cerebellar vermis and uh, whether the um, cerebellar vermis was dysplastic. Um, and you know, the more issues you find, the more concerned you are about a syndromic anomaly. And we really do, we don't have. Um, this is another case, I believe, that um, the gestation was not uh, continued. Um, but we have multiple findings that, you know, ventricular megaly is generally apparent. Some of these other findings may be tougher to find on ultrasound. This was another, this is another unfortunate case. Uh, this patient was referred for ventricular megaly in her fetus. Um, and there was actually a progression of the ventri a rapid progression of ventricular megaly from the time that the ultrasound exam was done until the time that we did our fetal MRI. And I think the striking thing here uh, when looking at these images through the head are these fluid fluid levels that I, I mentioned before. Remember, we were looking at the ovarian cyst that had blood in it. Same thing here. Unfortunately, this is blood in the ventricles causing bilateral uh, ventricular megaly. Um, unfortunately, that's not the only finding. If we look, um, this uh, bright this uh, uh, bright area over here, these are the ventricles. This is the actual brain parenchyma, and you can see a separation of the brain parenchyma from the calvarium with T2 dark material, which on the T1 weighted images is bright. 
So not only are there intraventricular hemorrhages, but there are also bilateral subdural hematomas. Um, and again, we can see that kind of susceptibility uh, signal void in the areas of hemosiderin deposition. What's a little bit interesting here, unfortunate but interesting, um, you'll notice these fluid fluid levels in kind of different places on every image. Over here, the fluid fluid levels are la lateral. Over here, they're posterior. Over here, they're anterior. And that's because the fetus is, is floating around in the amniotic fluid. And as the fetus is floating around, the, um, the debris of the hemorrhage is layering in different directions. Okay, so, uh, oh, I forgot to mention, yes, on the sagittal image, there wasn't, this is another case where there was a posterior fossa cyst, which may have been contributing uh, initially to ventricular megaly. You don't, you don't really know. This is another, this is a zebra. Um, this was a, uh, a woman referred at 20 weeks. The history was ventricular megaly. Um, and on these images, we can certainly see ventricular megaly, but if we kind of look at the anterior portion of the brain relative to the posterior portion of the brain, there's an asymmetry in the kind of migrational pattern. This, we see lots of sulci and gyri posteriorly, but not very much anteriorly. So there, there is a migrational abnormality of some sort here. Also, when we kind of look at the calvarium, it looks very thin. Thick. So this is kind of maybe a normal thickness, but it's very thick back here. And you know, fetuses should never have a thick calvarium. That's a not a good sign. When we look at the sagittal view, we can see frontal bossing. We see the forehead extending well over the nasal bridge, and we see this tenting, this posterior tenting of the calvarium. These are signs of craniosynostosis. Okay, so this is a fetus where the cranial sutures have already closed in utero, and it results in, in multiple, facial, um, uh, multiple facial malformations. We can see here hypertelorism, the eyes are widespread, um, and again, that frontal bossing. This is called klebokshadl or cloverleaf, cloverleaf skull. Um, it's a little tough to appreciate, but the upper extremities were very small. And even more concerning was the size of the fetal thorax. These are very small, restricted lungs, and they're dark. Okay, we expect to see a little bit more fluid in the lungs at this gestational age. Um, when you kind of put this together, um, this is very typical for thanatophoric dysplasia. Um, some of you may have heard of this, some of you in the pediatric world may have heard of this. This is called a death-bringing uh, skeletal dysplasia. This is an invariably lethal um, dysplasia because uh, these, these babies have such short ribs that the, they're never really able to, to take their first breath. It's a very, um, it's a tragic diagnosis. Um, and this, this in specific was, was we were able to make a diagnosis of type 2, which is associated with the cloverleaf skull. Um, and just very rapidly, I'm going to just go through the last couple of cases um, where we, some cases we were able to provide prognostication. Um, over here in this particular case, there, we were referred for evaluation of a, a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And on these images of the fetus, um, over here, you can see the heart as a signal void, and then right next to it, you see the stomach bubble. The stomach should never be at the same level as the heart. So we already have a diagnosis, pretty much, of congenital diaphragmatic hernia. But when we scroll more posterior within the thorax, we see this is the normal appearance of the lung. And then on the other side, we have this heterogeneous fluid-containing structure. Okay? As, we do the, as we look at the T1 images, we can see some meconium in the rectosigmoid, but we also see meconium-containing structures within the thorax. Again, this is an axial view. We can see meconium-containing structures in the thorax. So this is confirmatory of a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And again, these are just sagittal views. On the right side, you see the heart shifted over. There's a mediastinal shift. We can see the diaphragm on the right side. And on the left side, there's no diaphragm. We can see all of these bowel loops extending up into the thoracic cavity. Um, I just wanted to show that we can, you know, obtain measurements. And, um, very often in ultrasound, we use linear measurements. Um, 
uh, just about diaphragm management very, very, very briefly. Most of the ones that we talk about are, um, are uh, intrapleural diaphragmatic hernias, but there are, are other types that we're able to um, elucidate. And uh, about 50% about of these cases can have, have an aneuploidy um, and other associated anomalies. Um, but just getting back to those measurements, uh, I apologize, the slides were out of order. Um, whereas in the ultrasound, we use linear measurements. In MRI, we're actually able to do uh, accurate fetal lung volumes, which act as um, a really important prognostic factor in these, in these babies, because essentially we need to know how much of this lung has developed and how much of it is hypoplastic because of mass effect from the congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And there are all sorts of, um, all sorts of measurements that, that have been used over the, over the years. And the question is, can, you know, can we potentially use this to predict uh, babies that will need to exit to ECMO, which is when we, you, know, you do a partial delivery of the baby, keep them attached to the placenta, attach them to ECMO, and then you can uh, disconnect the placenta. So will, will we need that? You know, maybe, maybe there's some future in that. This is the companion case. Of course, anytime we see a congenital diaphragmatic hernia, our differential diagnosis is a congenital pulmonary airway malformation. These are the lesions that used to be known as CCAMs, congenital cystic adenomatoid malformations, but we have a, a different classification system now. And in this fetus, on these coronal views, this is a normal uh, view through the front of the baby, but as we kind of scroll back, we see this T2 hyperintensity, we see a cystic lesion, and this is the normal side, and this is the abnormal side. But again, on both sides, we see a complete diaphragmatic, uh, we see a complete uh, diaphragm telling us that whatever this lesion is, this is not originating from the abdomen. And that's confirmatory of uh, congenital pulmonary uh, airway malformation. There's a spectrum of, um, of bronchopulmonary foregut malformations. Um, there's a classification system um, that uh, I'm not uh, going to go through right now. Um, I'm just gonna kind of end up, I'm just gonna kind of stop over here. Um, I think it's really important for us to really be unambiguous with our conversations with patients that fetal MRI is safe. Um, it is a challenging modality, both acquiring the images and interpreting them is very challenging. Um, it is not a substitute for um, ultrasound. We should never say that it is better than ultrasound. It is a complementary modality. It provides different information. Um, and uh, for anyone in the audience, if you're interested in contacting me, this is my, uh, my email address. Uh, if you have any questions that you think of after the lecture. And here are just a couple of um, resources that you, that you may want to use. Um, Society for Pediatric Radiology has a really great uh, information uh, section on fetal MRI. And if you ever want to just kind of look at some really um, cool images of fetal MRI. The, um, um, Harvard has online, it's available for free. Um, you can look up, um, their atlas is actually done. You, you, you can see what the normal anatomy looks like throughout gestation uh, from around um, 17 weeks all the way through delivery. Um, it's a really great resource, uh, particularly if you are um, ever looking at images on your own. Um, and with that, I, I can take any questions. Dr. Teitelman, what a fascinating subject this is. It is simply remarkable the past 10 years and the evolution of uh, the MRI and how not only now the radiologist becomes uh, the allied for the other medical professionals, but uh, you guys are the front end uh, to become the initial diagnostician that will cast an opinion on something based on these incredible images. It has always been a challenge. It has always been somewhat of, a, um, it's mystified. I mean, how do you actually come out with these diagnoses? It is simply, simply uh, remarkable. It's very, uh, I, I would just say that, you know, these, um, interpreting these images really takes a very long time to learn how to do it gain experience and really feel comfortable, which is why it's so important that um, we have this kind of environment, this partnership with Baptist, um, 
to allow us to have those resources and really progress in our, in our own learning, but also progress in terms of patient care. It's really been a um, fascinating program. So it's been a great program to work with. It is, and it has been. And uh, obviously, uh, part of the audience has heard me say this before, but uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, we are a, uh, an organization that uh, always looks up to technology. Upgrading technology is something that we're always uh, looking for. Aside, uh, you did mention uh, initially, obviously, safety is key in anything and everything that we do in medicine. Aside from the movement, uh, what, is, what is it that you consider to be the biggest challenge when you're performing MRI uh, studies of this nature? I mean, aside from motion, I think size is, is, uh, is really the, the number one issue. So, you know, when you think about it, just thinking in terms of the most common referral, um, by the way, I apologize that the fire alarm is going, so I, I know that I'm, I'm flashing on. Perfectly okay. <laughs> um, you know, aside from motion, definitely I, I would say size. So we're often, um, the most common referrals are for um, absence of small structures that are difficult to visualize on ultrasound, so specifically corpus callosum and septum pellucidum, and I would also say cerebellar vermis. Now, these are intrinsically very small structures. So as I mentioned, you know, um, our limit, the limit of our slice thickness is, is three millimeters, that we really can't go beyond that without losing, um, without losing signal. Um, so when you're kind of slicing through and you're just, you're kind of like, well, am I missing the cerebellar vermis because I'm slightly off axis and it's a, you know, one or two millimeter structure that I'm not seeing on this three millimeter slice. I think that's really the biggest challenge. And there's, there's, um, I think it leads to a little bit of a, you know, difference in desire from our referring doctors, uh, from us, you know, the radiologist, we always want to image as late as possible because mm -hmm. we're going to get the best diagnosis. As the parts get larger and larger, it'll be easier for us to see. On the other hand, understandably, we want to come up with a diagnosis as early as possible so that we can figure out what the management um, uh, and, and, and continuity of the, of the gestation will be. So I, I would say size is probably the size. second most. Uh, Dr. David Martin uh, is making a comment. She says, commenting on a great talk, uh, companion to us in the uh, MFM world. Yes, doctor. a couple of those cases were Dr. Martin's cases, so thank you, Dr. Martin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great referral source for us as well, Dr. Martin. Thank you for all you do for our patients. Um, uh, Charmaine Hayes, uh, what is the prognosis when omphalocell is detected in fetus as uh, such um, shown in the image with multiple organs? Um, so I showed two cases um, of omphalocell. One was um, an isolated omphalocell, so just an isolated upper anterior abdominal wall defect. Um, and then I showed a case with multiple anomalies. Uh, one was the omphalocele, one was the bladder uh, extrophy, the spinal anomaly. So they ha they have different um, they have different prognoses. Um, so I think the classic teaching we always kind of compare uh, gastroschisis and omphalocele, and the the keyword is gastroschisis good, omphalocele bad. That's not a very good. Um, it's, it's not a very good statement. Um, it's uh, gastroschisis is good with reference to associated anomalies. So gastroschisis is less associated with aneuploidy. Um, um, Follocele will more likely be associated with other systemic anomalies and chromosomal anomalies. Um, gastroschisis it, in some cases may not necessarily have, the, the child may have a good prognosis, but the bowel may not have a good prognosis. The reason being the abdominal wall defect tends to be smaller. Mm -hmm. So as the bowel is protruded, there, there's more, uh, more of a chance of vascular compromise. But getting back to omphalocele, um, again, high, high rate of associated anomalies, the more um, concurrent anomalies, the worse the prognosis. Um, um, and um, 
with those spinal anomalies, we can, we can assume um, that there were going to be some neurological, uh, some significant neurological uh, compromise. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's tough for me to make a, an overall statement of uh, prognosis in every case of omphalocele, but they, again, they are more commonly associated with uh, other anomalies. Um, thank you for the fantastic or fascinating information. Uh, in the diaphragmatic hernias, can the fetus have surgery in uterus or depending on the problem, you wait until the baby is born? Um, so that's where prognostication um, and the met, kind of the metrics uh, comes in. Mo the vast majority of diaphragmatic hernias are a uh, watch and wait situation. Um, the cases where we start talking about potential surgery, and just to put it out there, we do not do fetal surgery here. Mm -hmm. So um, the criteria may maybe in flux at other institutions. Um, we don't even start really talking about potential intervention until we're suspecting fetal hydrops, uh, severe, um, severe uh, pulmonary hypoplasia. So in the vast majority of cases, the answer is it's, it's a, a watch and wait. And the, uh, the children are generally repaired immediately after surgery. Uh, they're intubated immediately upon delivery and they're repaired after, after delivery. Now, doctor, it, we see now more than ever a combination of technologies uh, being used uh, in order for us to not only diagnose, but uh, to treat patients. For instance, we do use imaging, uh, the imaging force uh, when we're doing uh, proton therapy, mm -hmm. uh, especially to uh, monitor the movement of a particular tumor, let's say in the lung or in the abdominal cavity. Uh, and that is absolutely fascinating as well. Uh, what are you more ex most excited about uh, for the future uh, in regards to technology in MRI in particular? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, uh, specifically within fetal MRI? Yeah, fetal MRI or MRI technology that you have been exposed to or seen that is coming your way. Um, I think I, I've really enjoyed I mean, it's enjoy, but um, I, I, I think one of the really interesting areas that I haven't done myself in my practice, um, but it has been described at a couple of children's institutions is actually um, the replacement of PET imaging in certain instances. So for, for oncology workups, the replacement of PET imaging, which is a fairly high radiation dose, um, replacing the PET portion with diffusion-weighted MRI imaging. So rather than using a, um, uh, a PET overlay on top of the anatomic images to, to demonstrate uh, metabolic activity, um, they're able to use diffusion-weighted imaging. And there are also certain other flavors of diffusion-weighted imaging that have kind of been proposed. And I know that they're using, I believe it's St. Jude's. Mm -hmm. I believe that's where I heard the talk. I got really really excited about that because that has major implications um, for diagnosis and follow-up with low radiation, um, low radiation modalities. It's that, mm -hmm. That's going to be fascinating if that pans out. Well, I am not a radiologist, but I had that in my mind uh, to ask you, uh, PET MRI or PET CT, and I know that we have very few units in the United States nowadays. Uh, so we're hoping to actually get you one in the future. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that's um, we're very much looking forward to that here. Yeah, yeah, that, that should be incredible, incredible yeah. ally, for, especially for oncologists uh, to, to, to have. Now, Dr. Teitelbaum, you know, we can keep you for yeah. a long period of time here, but we want to be considerate to you. <laughs> I want to thank you on behalf of our international team. And, uh, and I want to thank also our audience for participating today. If you do have any additional questions uh, for Dr. Teitelbaum, you, you saw his email, but you may also send your questions or additional um, concerns uh, to BHI webinars at baptisthealth.net. We'll make sure to forward those uh, to Dr. Tarbonbaum for him to review and we will send back. 
So we look forward to seeing you again in our next Women and Infants Lecture Series. Uh, we have scheduled that for February 9th, 2022. Meanwhile, thank you once again. Have a phenomenal afternoon and stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you. So much. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you.